Good morning, everybody. Let's kick off Grand Rounds here on this lovely spring day. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a very exciting season from my point of view because we'll have a series of Grand Rounds presentations coming up now from our residents and fellows here at the University of Minnesota Department of Psychiatry. And it's a wonderful culmination of their experiences and able to share something with us that they've taken a deep dive into understanding uh, and an exploration of the literature to bring us up to date on some topic of interest to them. And so Dr. Jonathan Holmans has been brave enough to start this series. And Jonathan is a wonderful resident who was part of our University of Minnesota Medical School, did our psychiatry residency at the University of Minnesota, and is now a first-year fellow at the University of Minnesota, a child and adolescent psychiatry program. His undergraduate was at Grinnell College, where he studied biology and evolution ecology. And uh, Jonathan is a very, Dr. Holmans is a, is a joy to work with in that he has a lot of intellectual curiosity. And if you kind of look at this um, evolution ecology background he comes from, he's really skilled at thinking broadly about systems, uh, broadly about some of the other things, the other variables that impact care and patient well-being. And so I'm really intrigued and excited that he's selected this topic, looking at the role of consumer pharmaceutical advertising in patient outcomes and patient care. And I was delighted to learn that he's going to be reserving a, a portion of this conversation today to allow for a lot of discussion and engagement with all of us to be able to explore some of these ideas. So no further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Homans. Can you, can you guys hear me all right? Uh, well, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, I chose this topic because, for a couple reasons. Um, one, I'm, I'm kind of a cynic at heart, and so oftentimes when I see advertisements, it kind of arouses something in me. Uh, and uh, I've just been thinking about this a little bit more, more recently, uh, and it, it, it always struck me as a little bit odd, um, the whole advertising and pharmaceuticals uh, related uh, issue. And so I wanted to take kind of a deeper look at it and get a, personally get a better understanding about how this develops in our country. Uh, and, and then uh, really, when I was thinking about this, this presentation, what I was really hoping for is a chance for us to sit down you know, as providers or people involved in uh, providing health care to people and, and really sit down and think about and kind of reflect on what the significance of some of these advertisements are for patients that we treat or interact with. And so uh, the structure of this talk is going to be, uh, I'm gonna do, we're going to do kind of a brief history lesson on how we got to where we are. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to kind of dive into watching some advertisements and talking about them as a group and, and thinking about kind of what the significance is for uh, our patients. Um, so... Let's see here. So I have no financial disclosures. And I want to have special thanks to Julie Donahue, who um, uh, provided a lot of the historical background for uh, information I'm going to discuss here. Um, OK. So our, our, our brief outline here is, is why, why I think this topic is important, which is going to be a relatively short uh, uh, piece. And then we're going to look at a historical perspective behind uh, consumer, direct to consumer advertising. And I'm actually going to take umbrage at the, the phrase direct to consumer advertising and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and then we're going to talk about we're going to watch some video advertisements and have a hopefully an interactive discussion surrounding what we see. Okay. So first off, why why does anybody care about this? Okay. So this is a map of the world. Um, the so the United States uh, does allow direct to consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals. Does anybody know what other countries also allow direct-to-consumer advertising? So there's one. Yes, New Zealand. New Zealand is the only other country in the entire world who allows direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical advertising, uh, which I think is interesting. It's a little bit. We're, we're kind of outliers. I'm not sure what else we have in common with New Zealand. I know we both speak English, um, but it's, it's just kind of interesting. And it, makes, you kind of, it kind of stands out, and you wonder why exactly that is. Um, that we're kind of outliers like that. Um, okay. So this is going to be a, a very brief summary of a lot of academic literature. 
So direct-to-consumer advertising definitely does affect prescribing practices, and there's a huge amount of literature on this. A lot of the studies look at mapping out where TV advertisements have been aired and the intensity of those advertisements, and then looking at prescriptions within those areas, which are not fantastic studies, but they do show a definite increase, dramatic increase, in the amount of prescriptions that are actually made for uh, different drugs that are advertised. Um, and it's been studied in a variety of settings. So this is a really interesting study looking at uh, direct-to-consumer television advertising, uh, looking at statins. And actually they found uh, there was a big increase in the uh, usage of statins in areas where that's heavily advertised on TV. Not only that, but the people who are getting those new prescriptions tend to be a much, much lower cardiac risk level than people prior. So not only was it increasing the number of uh, prescriptions that were actually filled, but it was also kind of capturing a different demographic and perhaps a healthier and demographic that was less likely to benefit from the medications. This is interesting. Um, this is an interesting study looking at uh, direct-to-consumer advertising and looking at the stigma of mental illness. And so they looked at uh, individuals who identified as having mental illness, individuals who uh, did not, or kind of control group, and then they showed them a variety of advertisements, including pharmaceutical advertising. Uh, uh, surrounding psychotropics, and then they at assessed attitudes towards mental illness after the fact. And so people who self-identified as having mental illness uh, were generally kind of more sympathetic towards uh, mental illness after, after the fact, whereas people who did not identify as having mental illness were in fact a little bit more callous, less empathetic. Uh, they were less likely to view mental illness as a legitimate diagnosis, uh, which is kind of Interesting, if you think about some of the broader implications there. Um, and here's, a, here's a, just another study looking at um, consumer perceptions and recall. And depending on the, the act, what's included within the actual advertisement itself, whether or not it's compared with a, uh, if they, within the advertisement, compare it to an alternative treatment, um, if they make statements such as, when diet and exercise has failed, consider blah, 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 all of this has a very clear impact on patients' perceptions and what they recall about side effects and benefits from medications. Uh, and so it's not just crap on TV. It actually does have an impact on, on prescribing practices and how we practice medicine, even if we would prefer that it doesn't, I guess, is my point here. Um, and you know, if there's one thing I've learned through you know, some psychodynamic education in my training is that there is value in bringing the subconscious and unconscious into the conscious. And so I think trying to, you know, one of the, one of the goals here is to try to understand you know, from our perspective and spend some time looking at this uh, and seeing if we can kind of you know, work our way through it. Uh, before I get started on this, the historical background behind pharmaceutical advertising to consumers, uh, I want to talk about consumer rights versus patients' rights, which will come up later in our historical kind of view. But I think understanding some of the differences here is really important for understanding kind of the historical arc for direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical advertising. Um, so, uh, and so I just wanted to go over the concept before we kind of go back into the history. So first off, so if we look at, if we start off with consumer rights, which I think is a little bit easier to understand. This is a movement that really got going in the 1990s. Uh, but the understanding was is that there was, uh, in the relationship between the producer and the consumer of a product, there, were, there, was, uh, there was an asymmetry there. And the goal uh, of consumer rights advocacy was to try to level the playing field. And the predominant way to do that was through in providing information to, different, to, to, pe to consumers out there. And so the goal was really trying to get things on an equal play uh, playing field, making things are equal as much as possible, and allowing people to make fair decisions about uh, their life. This works great for like the ketchup aisle, where there are you know, 400 varieties of ketchup, and you can compare the calorie content, et cetera. You know, ketchup is, is, a, is a kind of a luxury item. I, maybe some people would argue that they need it, but I would classify it as the want category. It works, works great in that context. Um, works l less well in healthcare. There are some kind of in-between cases. So if you think about the automobile industry where uh, there are also some top-down regulations and, and other things in place too. But uh, the goal here is to let the free market work, but to provide people with enough, med uh, enough information to be able to make informed decisions. I'm going to contrast that with, with patient rights, which is an earlier movement beginning in the 1970s. 
with patient rights, they, they, uh, it's recognized that there is no way to completely level the playing field between a doctor and a patient, unless you send everybody to medical school. There's just no way to really re repl ad adequately replicate the amount of information that you have as a provider or experience. And so trying to, to aim for equality is just not feasible at all. Um, so instead of trying to, to even the play, playing field, what, they, what the goal was is to move the patient more, in, more involved in the decision making uh, and uh, to try to even it out to some degree but not achieve equality. And that's an important distinction. The main ways that they were looking to do this uh, was to really underscore the fiduciary responsibility of physicians. And fiduciary is a legal term, but it basically means that uh, um, it's acting in someone else's best interest. So really having somebody else's best interest at heart while you're making decisions. Um, and that is intimately involved in working with your patient to understanding their perspective and working with them to make decisions. You know, it's not that the patient gets to make the decisions and you just follow through on them. It's really working together, understanding that there's an asymmetry in uh, in kind of experience and, and uh, information. And the other, the other half of this is, is providing information and, and uh, encouraging advocacy among patients, um, positioning them in a better uh, place to work with a provider uh, and advocate for themselves. So again, the goal is not equality. And the goal is not to provide equal information necessarily, but the goal is to increase the involvement of a patient in their own care. OK. Uh, so. Does that kind of make kind of make sense? That distinction there. Yeah. I see some people nodding. Okay, um, and these themes will come up, and I'll try to highlight them as we go along. So, the historical perspective: we're going to start off kind of just prior to the year 1900. Uh, this this is the phenomenal advertisement. So, for this is for Ham, Hamlin's Wizard Oil, which was a wildly popular patent medicine around the time. Uh, as you can see, uh, on this advertisement, it's got a picture of an elephant drinking a bottle of a kind of brownish liquid. Uh, and it says, Hamlin's wizard oil cures all pain in man or beast. Um, they, they didn't stop there. So this is, so uh, one of the things that was interesting about this time period is that Western medicine was really kind of in, a, in its infancy in a lot of respects. So we had relatively few medications. Most of those medications had somewhat questionable efficacy and had significant side effects associated with them. We didn't have a whole lot of great evidence base to, to base our decision on at that point. Um, but ethically speaking, doctors were very invested in their patients and were trying to do the best by them, which is contrasted with the patent medicine industry, which was trying to make money off of people, usually by exploiting their fears uh, or uh, worries. Uh, so Hamlin's wizard oil, uh, it didn't stop at pain. Um, so it claimed that they were able to treat uh, rheumatism, neuralgia, toothache, headache, diphtheria, sore throat, lame back, sprains, bruises, corns, cramps, colic, diarrhea, all pain and inflammation. It will also check the growth and permanently cure cancer if it's begun early enough in, this, in the stages of cancer. Um, also hydrophobia, which I believe is rabies, if you clean out the bite with the wizard oil. Uh, you, could use, you could drink it or put it on topically on your body. Um, tumors, da, 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 it, it keeps going on and on and on. The actual contents of wizard oil, uh, it was about, uh, the, actually the, the ingredients widely varied based on who was making it and where it was being made, but it's 50 to 70% alcohol, it also had camphor, ammonia, chloroform, sassafras, cloves, and turpentine. Uh, delicious sounding to me. <laughs> um, it, it, and actually, you see these the, the guys in the silk top hats to the left there in that little wagon. They'd actually roll into town with this whole kind of parade, uh, circus kind of atmosphere. They would have big top tents. Uh, it was kind of a festival. So actually, this is kind of, an, I think, an accurate description. I think the crowds are probably embellished here, but an accurate description, very much into uh, selling this and kind of making it into a spectacle. Uh, patent medicines were not trivial, so they accounted for roughly half of all revenue of newspapers prior to 1900. So these were a huge, huge part of society. And in fact, uh, the right to self-diagnose and self-treat was considered quite sacred uh, and uh, highly respected both politically and socially throughout the time. The AMA did not like this, and uh, I think for a couple reasons. Uh, it, 
the cynic would say it was mainly self-interested because they were taking away market share. I think probably more accurately it was uh, ethically based that these were not individuals who had people's welfare at heart. They were trying to make money, um, at, often at people's expense. And so the AMA actually began slandering uh, patent medicines. And some of the accounts are just hilarious. They just they, they publish these. They, publish all of these just incredibly negative kind of slandering ads about uh, patent medicines, kind of entertaining to read. Um, the, where things really got, got started, and, and, and this is, you know, when we talk about the, the patient rights and consumer rights, uh, the beginning history of medications and prescription medications and advertising um, show that there was very much kind of this consumer rights mentality, this idea that, you know, if we can if we can spread out the information so everybody has the same information, people will be able to make good, good choices about things. And that was really what the, the 1906 Pure F Food and Drug Act was about. So it was the biggest thrust of it was related to food uh, and additives in food. So oftentimes uh, people were shipping uh, tainted or spoiled meat that had various preservatives added to it that were toxic for individuals. That was the major thrust of this uh, act. So basically what it was requiring producers uh, to do was accurately label what was in there, uh, the things that they were selling. Didn't talk about safety, didn't talk about efficacy or anything like that. It's merely that whatever you say is on the bottle is in the actual bottle. Um, the, uh, originally, the thought was that it would apply to some of these false claims, like saying that it cured cancer, even when it clearly did not, uh, would be covered. However, uh, there's a Supreme Court case in 1911 which proved this, that, which they said, no, you don't have jur jurisdiction to regulate that. So in 1912, the Shirley Amendment was passed, which was the design that was to uh, prohibit false claims that were made with the intent to defraud the purchaser. The problem with it, though, is that this whole intent to defraud was very, very difficult to prove. And so virtually no cases were successfully prosecuted based on this. Um, OK. So by, this is, a, this is a quote from Julie Donahue. So by the 1930s, federal drug re regulators had abandoned the belief that consumers armed solely with information about a drug's ingredients could safely self-medicate. Throughout this time period, there were plenty of incidences of people being harmed by these medications uh, and uh, a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality related to these things. There was quite a lot of pr pressure from, uh, uh, from regulating agencies to try to put more teeth into some of their regulatory powers. However, there was uh, most of the pushback was was from politicians who did not want to infringe on individuals' rights to, to treat themselves and diagnose themselves. Um, because it was thought that that was just a very important part of, of living life. Um, and, then, and then things changed dramatically in 1937. This was back when Congress actually acted on crises as opposed to manufacturing crises and not acting, which is what happens now. But um, in 1937, uh, there was this uh, antibacterial drug called sulfonilamide, and it was used to treat uh, streptococcal infections. Uh, it had been widely used at the time uh, and was uh, efficacious. Uh, the, this manufacturer, so this is the S.E. Massengill uh, Pharmaceutical Company of Tennessee, uh, had heard that there was a need for additional, basically addition, a different form of the medication that children would be able to take more readily. And so they worked with their lead chemist to formulate a liquid version of sulfonilamide. Uh, and they found that this uh, dissolved most readily in diethylene glycol, which we kind of now know is a key element in uh, antifreeze. Uh, and they added a delicious raspberry flavor. Uh, they, they tested it for both taste and consistency and found it to be acceptable. And they shift off about 660 gallons to various parts of the United States. Uh, relatively, within the n next week or so, it became clear that people were actually dying after consuming this substance. And the FDA uh, went on this mad dash to try to secure as much of this uh, as possible. Uh, all in all, about a, over 100 individuals died after consuming this medication, uh, the majority of which were children. Um, and this is really a, an awful event in history, and it really um, kind of uh, spurred some political action. So this is a quote from the, the owner of the pharmaceutical company. So saying, my chemists and I deeply regret the fatal results, but there was no error in the manufacture of this product. 
We've been supplying a legitimate professional demand and not once could have foreseen the unlooked for results. I do not feel that there was any responsibility on our part. Which I think now is a little bit of a shocking statement. Uh, but at the time, it really reflects this idea that people were able to make decisions based on uh, uh, the information that they were provided, which I think this case clearly indicates that when it comes to some things, it's just not appropriate. Now, what was interesting about this, so this was marketed as the elixir of sulfonilamide. Elixir, elixir implies, at this time, legally implied that it was a solution of alcohol, which it was not because it was dissolved in diethylene glycol. So if they had sold this as a solution of sulfonilamide, the FDA would have had absolutely no powers to seize any of these shipments. So I think that's, that kind of underscores exactly how limited regulation was at that time. Uh, so in fact, they were, just based on that word, technically it was mislabeling. Now, although the owner of the pharmaceutical company clearly is attempting to advocate responsibility, the, the lead chemist did not. Uh, and once uh, it had been discovered what had happened, he committed suicide shortly thereafter. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, this, is, this is really a watershed moment in regulation and, and, and drug history in this country. So the next year, uh, the Food and Drug Act, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is passed, uh, and the FDA actually starts kind of regulating stuff. And it's, this is primarily looking at safety. So after this point, anybody selling a, a drug had to go to the FDA to get approval to prove that it was safe to be consumed by humans. This had nothing to do with efficacy at the time, um, but surely they had, to, they had to prove safety. What's interesting is at this time, uh, the FDA wasn't actually uh, it wasn't regulating any advertisements. Those were all being uh, regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, which is kind of interesting. Um, but this gave them increased regulatory power to, uh, uh, to determine at least safety in the public sphere. And I, and I should underscore, until this point, there was basically no distinction between over-the-counter and prescription medications. So prescriptions could be written by doctors, uh, but that was more of a, considered more of a convenience. Patients could go directly to a pharmacist to get pretty much any medication except for narcotics, uh, uh, and even those were relatively easy to obtain. But there really, there was no real sense of kind of a prescription versus over-the-counter drug, uh, even at this point. So 1951, this is kind of the modern era of the prescription. So in, the, in 1951, or I should say, Going back, in 1938, this act uh, delineated between over-the-counter drugs, which required certain, uh, they required certain information, which is consistent with what you see on an over-the-counter drug label today. Uh, and then it also identified that there were some medications that could be labeled as only could be prescribed by a doctor or a veterinarian. Uh, however, those were determined by the drug companies, not by the FDA. Uh, so in 1951, the big shift in 1951 with the Durham-Humphrey Amendment is that uh, the FDA started determining who could prescribe what and what medications could only be obtained through uh, uh, permission of a doctor, basically. Um, uh, at this point, even in 1951, advertisements were being regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, uh, and there was no real actual particular... Uh, need to prove efficacy. The thought at the time was that physicians were totally capable of determining whether or not medications were effective or not. And they would be able to determine, uh, they were able to sort through advertisements. This is kind of the gold, 1951 to 1962 was kind of the golden age of uh, pharmaceutical misadvertising in which uh, doctors were heavily targeted uh, with detail men, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there were often very cozy relationships there. In 1962, the FDA, there were two major changes in 1962 with the uh, Kefauver Harris amendments. One, you had to prove efficacy. So F, that's when the FDA really stepped into proving that things had to be efficacious. And also, they took over uh, uh, regulation of pharmaceutical advertising at that point. This is a paper advertisement <laughs> from that period. It says, if she calls you morning, noon, and night, day after day after day, to lay her chronic neurotic anxiety, try her on Stelazine, which is, which is a, a first-generation antipsychotic. Um, uh, obviously, this is not directed at patients. This is 
actually, in fact, pretty insulting towards patients. Um, uh, and it seems to be more not so much indicated for anxiety as it is for indicated for patients who bother you a lot. Um, yeah, so there are obviously some, I think, some ethical problems with this kind, kind of advertising. It's, it's, it's amusing in retrospect to, to look at the, some of these advertisements because some of them are just god awful, and this is not, by and large, not even the most offensive one I could find. Uh, and there are loads of websites. A lot of these like, kind of anti psychiatry organizations have just troves of these online. So you can browse to your heart's content. Um, uh, so um, moving on. So in 1969, the FDA released rules governing drug advertising, which required the true statement of information in brief summary relating to side effects, contraindications, and effectiveness. And this, is, um, this has the most implication for uh, TV advertising. And when it says brief summary, the joke is that the, it's, it's neither brief nor a, summony, a sum, summary, uh, but it's this exhaustive catalog of everything that could theoretically go wrong and every piece of information that could possibly be associated with this medication. And you see these today in, in advertisements in medical journals with the, you see the, the fancy ad and then there's like eight pages of really tiny print after that. And the significance of this is that there's, there's basically no way to do a TV commercial and include the brief summary in its entirety. And what was interesting is that the, the, the FDA did include a provision saying that you could circumvent the entire brief summary if adequate provision was made in the advertisement. But it's this very vague term that went undefined for uh, about three decades. Uh, and so TV advertisements, uh, TV advertisements were very limited throughout this period until the late 90s. Um, Right around this time is also when the patient rights movement started, which we talked about earlier, but again, trying to reestablish more balance but not equality in the doctor-patient relationship. And then later in the 1990s, uh, the consumer rights movement uh, occurred. Now, the reason that the consumer rights movement is important is because it, these, these get conflated. And I think there's some real hazards with conflating patient rights with consumer rights. I think there's some areas where it's totally appropriate uh, to try to level a playing field in terms of advertisements, but there are other areas where it is very inappropriate. And, uh, and the reason that consumer rights is important to understand, especially in this context, is that the pharmaceutical industry jumped on the consumer rights bandwagon and started applying it to pharmaceutical advertising and pharmaceuticals in general. And there's a couple things uh, that related to this, one of which is that there were a number of medications that came out in the 80s and early 90s, which were considered uh, like lifestyle medications, the flagship of which was Rogaine, which is a product for growing hair. If you think about baldness, this is not something that most doctors would say, you look bald, do you, you want a medication to help out with that? Typically, this would be a product that a patient would bring the concern because it was directly affecting their lifestyle, but not so much their... their um, uh, a life defining illness necessarily. And so there was an opportunity in the pharmaceutical industry to really get patients to start the conversations about these medications in order to bolster prescriptions. There's a lot of other medications that fall in this category, um, like your Viagras do. Uh, there's, you can debate about this. I think in a lot of cases, antidepressants certainly can fall in this category or some other anti anxiety medications as being quality of life related issues that were. Um, perhaps, uh, for whatever reason, not really di addressed directly by a lot of physicians, but brought up more by patients. And so the, the, the potential impact of reaching the patient population was much larger during this time period. And it just fits in really nicely with the whole idea of consumer, consumer rights. So the, the way that this was approached is that the, the pharmaceutical, a lot of pharmaceutical companies said that, well, if we present, we're, we're providing people with information. We're giving them information about diseases. We're giving them information about op treatment options out there, and people can make their own decisions. And that's great. And we're disseminating information, and this is about consumer rights and restoring your rights. And I think there are some problems with that. There was a lot of pressure. So we're talking about the, we're talking about the 90s here. So there's a lot of interesting other political issues going on here. Um, this is during the Republican takeover of Congress in 1994. There was a lot of political pressure against regulation. So this is when uh, Newt Gingrich called the FDA the number one job killer in the America. Um, this is also around the time period where uh, 
uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic was occurring and there was a huge amount of pressure to speed up the approval of drugs because there were people out there dying and there was a lot of pressure being put on the FDA to try and change their outlook. The FDA was criticized as being uh, kind of paranoid and more focused on preventing uh, dangerous drugs to get to market than they were at getting efficacious drugs to market. And based on their history, you can understand why. Uh, but this is this has occurred in a lot of a lot of political pressure. This is also around the time where you know the tobacco industry was beginning to be targeted by the FDA. There are a lot of political issues that were tied in here as well. Um, uh, so throughout the 90s, largely due to political pressure, the FDA decided to uh, redefine the adequate provision for the brief summary in television advertisement. So they defined this rule that had been in place since the 1960s, but had essentially been inaccessible to pharmaceutical companies because there were no details. And this is what they this is what they clarified. So they said instead of airing the entire brief summary, the ads could refer consumers to toll-free numbers, print ads, a website, and or their pharmacists or physicians to whom they could complete obtain complete information about the product's risks and benefits. And this really with this rule definition really opened the floodgates when it comes to TV advertising. There had been TV advertisements prior to this. However, most of them either included the disease indication or the medication itself, but not both. And so therefore they could kind of subvert the uh, brief summary requirement. So they might show a slogan and have certain thematic appearances in the advertisements, but not actually, but only mention the disease name and then have those same thematic elements occur in an advertisement for a drug, but not say what it was indicated for. Uh, but those were complicated and kind of hard to do. And so they weren't weren't that prevalent. But after 1997, things changed dramatically. This is a quotation from the president of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America advocacy group. So it says, direct-to-consumer advertising is an excellent way to meet the growing demand for medical information, empowering consumers by educating them about health conditions and possible treatments. And this is, you know, when we talk about the difference between patient rights and consumer rights, it, it's very clear where a lot of pharmaceutical companies were putting their money, and they were really promoting this idea that um, this is a consumer rights issue, this isn't a patient's rights issue. Uh, we need to educate people, and pharmaceutical companies are in the best position to do that, as if they're you know, kind of an altruistic public health kind of message. And I, I've got a strong cynical streak, so if I come off as a little bit too cynical, I apologize for that. Um, but this kind of this really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, and I, I get kind of a little bit upset about. This is uh, total pharmaceutical industry spending on direct-to-consumer advertising. So as you can see, it was present prior to 1997, uh, but spending on this uh, increased dramatically. Uh, we're currently sitting at about $4.5 billion a year spent on direct-to-consumer advertising in this country. There was a dip uh, with the, the recession uh, but it's kind of come back up. Uh, and interestingly, now there's also a huge amount of money spent on internet advertising, which is different uh, economically speaking, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and the moral of this is that drug companies wouldn't spend this money if this wasn't helpful for them in some way. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of, there have been a lot of studies looking at the cost effectiveness of direct to consumer advertising. Um, but the, the fact that this has become such a, a an important uh, investment in drug companies indicates how important it is to their revenue stream. To put this a little bit in perspective, pharmaceutical companies still spend way more, way more money advertising to physicians than they do direct to consumers, which I thought was interesting. Um, so. You know, uh, those of you in the room who are physicians or soon to be physicians are still going to be kind of the number one target for pharmaceutical companies uh, looking to advocate for their drugs. Uh, but, but this is a this is a definitely a close second. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? So this is kind of the end of the history segment of this presentation. Do you guys have any questions at this point or th ideas that this has brought up or thoughts that you guys have? Dr. Jensen, you look like you're. This is 2005. The actually the amount has stayed. Oh, 
Sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Olson was asking, well, this ends at 2005. What have things done recently? Um, the, the figure is actually pretty similar. It hasn't changed dramatically. It's gone up slightly, but the, the slope essentially levels out after about, after about 2005, 2006. So I guess the, the, thought I was having, the thought I was having was that at the same time, the, there were all these detailed people, you know, men and women, and they were chosen for attractiveness and athletic ability, I think and uh, not much else, and, and they would have a mission from the, they had their story to tell, and in the worst case scenario, they would uh, just ignore everything. The, the ADD specialist would say, use Ritalin because that's our product, and I'd say, but you can use amphetamine. They'd say, well, no, 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 just use Ritalin. The next year they had amphetamine. They'd say, use amphetamine, not Ritalin, and I'd say, but last year I was telling you, you know, but they would, you know, they would ignore all that because it had a mission, and I wondered, there was a stop to that. 2009, January 1, 2009 was the last time any drug company person could come in any place and there was limitation on pens and pencils. And when I was uh, in the class of 72 and we started in 68, they gave us um, bags and pens and reflex hammers and tapes and, and you know, all the stuff you ever would need. The class Next class, starting in 69, said, absolutely not. We're going to take that. We're not going to take Some of them said that, so they didn't give them anything. So there was this already beginning of the movement back in the 60s to say, wait, we're being influenced too much, or we shouldn't take all this stuff. And it's so I think you had kind of this parallel to going to consumers. You have this beginning resistance, and then you had places like Hennepin saying, no, we're not going to let a drug company in the door. Um, and, and that spread to everybody by, I would say, 2009. It was officially, they couldn't get in. Before that, there would be lunches. They'd take turn bringing lunch for everybody. I mean, not just doctors, but nurses and staff. And I mean, people will remember the great lunches that were brought in, <laughs> huge buffets. And I think in an attempt to establish some kind of rapport, um, and the detailed people, I think, were regularly in, uh, you know, especially non-system, you know, private practice, there were people all the time bringing in mm -hmm. all the time. So they, you almost had to have somebody dealing with the detail person. Uh, yeah, so so they're, they're um, not, I don't think federally. I think this has been a board of practice, state by state issue where uh, there's been more of a curtail and kind of the ethical, um, I guess conflicting of interest, and I didn't delve too much into the the doctor directed advertising or detail work. There's still a huge amount of money spent on advertising to doctors. A lot of that's through medical journals. A lot of that's through other means as well. Um, so, and there have been, I mean, kind of countless prosecutions on uh, detail people overselling or selling for alternative contra or indications and that type of thing as well, um, and plenty of abuses there. I do think, you know, I, uh, um, I. I, there certainly could be kind of a creative that the, the consumer was, or the patient was targeted kind of as a, you know, a shifting of focus because there was limit, more limiting, more access limited to uh, physicians and physicians groups. Um, uh, and that certainly could be the case as well. And I'm all about creativity. And I think, <laughs> and where, where I get kind of offended about this is I, I'm not entirely, I'm not sure I completely oppose the idea of advertising to patients, but I really, this idea of this is a public service that we're doing and that we're providing information to people that and we're you know championing patient rights is that's what I could kind of take a lot of umbrage at. Um, okay, oh Beth. You know, I did the American College of OBGYN a few years ago did come out with a statement that said, you know, don't let drug reps show up at your practice unannounced, and they had real good stipulation as to like get rid of these kind of scumbags. I kind of feel like they, it was, I mean, they were just, you know, they, when I was in private practice, they'd show up unannounced, <laughs> disrupt patient care. Like, and I had staff who loved them because they brought them lunch. And things. Uh, But the Sunshine Act, I think, was around, I don't know if it was 2009, I was in private oh, okay. practice, 2010. Um, and it, like at 2011, 2012, they were still lurking and slithering in my office once in a while. Um, but, but yeah, what it is, is it was, um, 
that kind of did away with those men for physicians um, because it required manufacturers of drugs, medical devices, and biologicals that participate in U.S. federal health care programs to report certain payments. But I think it did go also to, um, it was to regulate mm. who they were trying to access. Okay. Um, and they, it got rid of all the gifts. Okay. I don't know if that helped. Well, thank you, Beth. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, and now, so th this section, we're going to look at a couple of, and we're going to watch them together. And if you can't stand the, like, all the side effects that they list, because this gets kind of repetitive and made me kind of nauseous after watching all of them multiple times, you can just plug your ears during that, you know, three quarters of the advertisement. Um, uh, the goal of this, I really want... I would really love for us to, to be able to kind of have an interchange about this. Think about this from the perspective of a patient. Think about how this could impact our patient-doctor uh, relationship or, or provider relationship. Um, and, you know, I, I look at some of the, I don't know, subtle things that are going on with some of these advertisements and, and talk about them. Because I don't think... I, what, I don't think that we should just ignore this and just pretend like it's not happening. I think it's important for us to understand, you know, what our patients are experiencing and how they're looking at the, these type of situations and how that could affect our interactions with them as well. Uh, my, my disclaimer is that I'm kind of cynical and I don't really have much advertising um, talents. If I was asked to advertise for a pharmaceutical industry, I'd probably come up with something like this. And so I had no mean no way mean to slander uh, uh, the people of the ad industry who are, you know, their creativity is responsible for this. Um, uh, and so I apologize if I come off as a little bit cynical or, or um, uh, conspiracy theorist about this whole situation. But are we, are we ready to go? You guys ready? Okay, there we go. Here's, here's, this is advertisement number one. You know when you feel the weight of sadness. You may feel exhausted, hopeless, and anxious. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, you feel lonely and don't enjoy the things you once loved. Things just don't feel like they used to. These are some symptoms of depression, a serious medical condition affecting over 20 million Americans. While the cause is unknown, depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Prescription Zoloft works to correct this imbalance. You just shouldn't have to feel this way anymore. Only your doctor can diagnose depression. Zoloft is not for everyone. People taking MAOIs or Pimazide shouldn't take Zoloft. Side effects may include dry mouth insomnia, sexual side effects, diarrhea, nausea, and sleepiness. Zoloft is not habit forming. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft, the number one prescribed brand of its kind. Okay, we'll pause it there. This has been a while since the Zoloft commercials were out. Um, uh, any, any initial thoughts here? Responses to this? Better than the one we have these days. <laughs> it's better than the ones that we have these days. Why is it better? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is uh, information which is useful. It's pretty much quite a lot of the information that I talk to my patient, but it's not excessive information. And it's kind of, I mean, it's just overall, it's, it's a better ad than we, what we okay. had in 2015. I like the I like kind of like the simplicity of it. It's, it's very simple, Dr. Klein. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Is this working? They forgot the black box warning. But this is before the black box warning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a kind of dates it a little bit here. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about. Let me see. Can I rewind this here? Let me see here. You know. I want to watch it again. Okay. Um, the. Did you guys see the nerve A, nerve B diagram? What do you guys think about that? Is that what actually happens? <laughs> it's a, the nerve B doesn't have enough ping pong balls being thrown at it, and the Zoloft throws more ping pong balls. Um, there's, I mean, I don't know. The, the whole chemical imbalance thing, I don't know exactly what a chemical imbalance is, uh, but patients talk about it all the time, about this idea about it being a chemical imbalance. I, I think the idea is that by, by showing that diagram, uh, you kind of add scientific validity to what they're talking about. It makes it seem like it's, it's, a, it's a nerve ping pong ball problem and not a, like, my problem. And the only way to solve the nerve ping pong ball problem is through a medication that's going to redress the amount of ping pong balls hitting nerve B. Um, I think there's some, maybe some positive value in that. 
right? It's kind of a, maybe a little bit of externalizing, maybe destigmatizing to some degree. It's not your fault. But on the other hand, it seems like a really simplistic and kind of cavalier explanation for depression, in my opinion, at least. Um, especially since we, you know, we know that the direct serotonergic blockade is not responsible for the antidepressant effect, as Dr. Jensen has pointed out to me time and time again. Um, and that these, sim these simplistic uh, explanations, I do think, have a cost associated with them as well. Um, we're going to, oh, go ahead, Dr. Kirgi. I think they used a really common tactic when addressing the general public, and that's fear. This is a very severe condition. You need to go talk to your doctor about it. They used language quite uh, directly and for a reason, I would imagine. I just want to say I think it highlights the difference between the consumer rights and the patient rights because consumer... The, when we're trying to inform patients about what's wrong, we try to we do try to create a simplistic model because we can't we're not on an equal playing field. Like we cannot impart to them everything we've learned in medical school about all different situations where medication helps, but we can't explain why. But in consumer rights, they're trying to tell them all the information that they need, and that we just know that that's not correct. And so, it just knowing that distinction now really highlight, that highlights it for me. You know, back to the FDA and the 1910, um, I think there's lots of aromatherapy and herbal therapy, potions, nostrums, uh, massage therapy, eye tracking. Uh, can I offend anybody more? But I will tell you that <laughs> there are Jensen. lots of alternative therapies that have new scientific evidence or high dose vitamin B. And when I call the people that are doing this, they say, well, we don't have time to do the research. That's for you people at the universities. So if anything, I think we're being bombarded with advertisements for things or word of mouth that's folklore, folk literature, and we're back in 1900, we're back in mm -hmm. uh, 1850. We're trying to, why shouldn't we use, uh, you know, something that somebody else said really works well. You know, and I've, over my career, I've, you know, I, I've had a lot of, people give me tapes and books and you got to do this. Um, I'll strike out at GeneSight as another kind of, tell me that that actually helps us. Does that really give us, uh, it seems to me like they end up with desvenlafaxine most of the time. I don't know if that's underwritten by the <laughs> makers of desvenlafaxine, but I'm very suspicious about all this other information. If this is promoting science, in some way it helps me with a patient who says, well, I don't want medications. I've had three years of therapy, treat my depression, but I don't want medications. That, that's a little bit of a difficult territory. Um, or when I'm on inpatient, somebody's overdosed, wants to die, and the parents both say, we don't want medications for kids, those bad. Well, that's fine. That's what I was taught in the 70s in a psychoanalytic program. That's what they said. There's one guy using medications in Cleveland. We asked the analyst. He took his pipe out of his mouth. He said, he's a maverick, and stuck his pipe back in. So <laughs> I, I think we got plenty of people thinking medications don't work and depression's not real, and if, and if you would just shut up and get out of my life I, and if die, please, yes. because I want you not to have this problem, you'd be better off dead. And I think, you know, I'm getting off on kind of this whole idea of suicide in adolescence, and people deny that there's such a thing and deny that the literature of the last 10 years that says medication and therapy is true. It's medication and therapy. It's mm -hmm. not, we don't do without either one. But there's plenty of people who are willing to say it doesn't exist and therefore I'm not going to treat it. So that's my idea. Yeah. Maybe these direct-to-consumer actually bring in science. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I do feel kind of conflicted about it because there are certain times where, I mean, we've had a patient recently where like, you know, it's not your fault that you're depressed, it's not your fault. This just happens sometimes. And that, and some of these externalizing ideas I think can be really helpful for that. Or externalizing metaphors, I should say. It's Dr. Klein. Question here. Uh, would you comment on other countries and drug advertisement where uh, European and South American, you can walk into a pharmacy and say, I'd like 150 milligrams of Wellbutrin SR, and you're, you're given it. 
what what do other countries do around advertising and how are they managing this problem and what have arisen yeah. uh, when one makes this diagnosis themselves and treats oneself? So I, I don't know a lot about that other than New Zealand is the only other country that allows direct-to-consumer advertising in mass. Um, and so I'm not sure how it's related to some of the more permissible pharmacy uh, regulations in other countries. Um, but they aren't widely advertised like they are here, with the exception of New Zealand. Okay. I gotta, uh, we're going to go on to the next ad here. Um, my antidepressant worked hard to help with my depression, but sometimes I still struggled to get going, even get through the day. So I was honest with my doctor. I told her I'd been feeling stuck for a long time, and I wondered if there was something more we could do. She said that for some people, an antidepressant alone only helps so much. That's when she suggested we add Abilify, Aripiprazole, to my treatment. She said that by taking both, some people had symptom improvement as early as one to two weeks. Having Abilify and an antidepressant working for me, it just made sense. I wish I'd talked to my doctor sooner. Abilify is not for everyone. Call your doctor if your depression worsens or you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Elderly dementia patients taking Abilify have an increased risk of death or stroke. Call your doctor if you have high fever, stiff muscles, and confusion to address a possible life-threatening condition, or if you have uncontrollable muscle movements, as these could become permanent. High blood sugar has been reported with Abilify, and medicines like it, and in extreme cases can lead to coma or death. Other risks include increased cholesterol, weight gain, decreases in white blood cells, which can be serious, dizziness on standing, seizure... This, this, it just doesn't stop. It just keeps going on and on. I think they mentioned death probably about five or six times. She's doing fine. She's got the lemonade. She's yeah, fine. She's smiling. She's um, fine. Yeah. What, what do you guys think about this? Is Dr. Dr. Redberg isn't here by any chance. Or anybody else from treatment? Or I don't know. Um, they don't use the word antipsychotic. You know, um, I, I invite people to bring up Abilify. Uh, to talk about, you know, it it's possibly possibly would be a good fit for them. And I say, I'm open to considering augmenting with an antipsychotic. Let's talk about the risks and benefits. And they say, whoa, I don't want to be on an antipsychotic. And I said, well, well, okay, well, I mean, that's fine. But let's let's we, you should have the information. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things about this ad is at the beginning, it's this very it, it paints the patient as being this very passive actor in the whole thing. So the antidepressant is doing all the work, getting them out of bed pushing them to the doctor, and then their antidepressant just isn't pushing them enough. It's just, it's just, I think that's kind of an interesting role. I don't advocate that for my patients. I generally think, like, you know, these medications can help, but they're a piece of the overall puzzle. Uh, and, and this idea that, like, waiting, waiting for your antidepressant to drag you out of bed, I don't know, seems a little bit problematic. Yes, Dr. Cullen? She was still kind of muted. Like, do you agree? Like, she wasn't as bummed out, but she was still kind of. She wasn't ecstatic. She was like yeah. 50%. Yeah. And so <laughs> oh, I was like, are they going to go into the bedroom pretty soon? And we can see how that's working out as well. Um, but I did see that, um, yeah, I, I was wondering if they were like, planned it that way because the Zoloft one was much sunnier as soon as the Zoloft really? came into play mm -hmm. and she I was wondering if they were like it's not going to make you super happy but it's going to make you functioning and you're going to be able to pass out your papers at work and pass out the lemonade at home <laughs> yes you're going you're to be the perfect automaton um, sorry no yeah it, it, there's an interesting tempering of expectations that occurs I think as well Yes, Dr. Olson? Uh, it also doesn't mention what the alternatives would be if your antidepressant isn't pushing hard enough. A different antidepressant, uh, lithium, thyroid. And I think that kind of goes back to the whole FDA efficacy versus placebo that, you know, now we can market anything if it's better than a placebo. Um, the most recent thing that I've been seeing is some drug for opioid-induced constipation, which oh, yeah, says something well. about opioids. Um, but, um, you know, is it better than Miralax? Um, I don't know. I bet it's way more expensive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this doesn't the, – the, the FDA, you know, restricts sort of comparative advertising, but I think that, like, 
they would have to, they can't say we're better than something else. Mm -hmm. But I think that it, it needs, it needs to be on the minds of the consumer that just because drug A has an ads for it doesn't mean it's the only thing that your doctor right. could do to help your depression or your constipation or whatever. And, and that's where I think like the, this idea behind, you know, patient rights and consumer rights, I think this is very much, you know, it's a, it's a doctor's job to know some of, like, what are the options that are out there and to be able to provide some context. Because, right, this is not the only option for an antidepressant that's partially effective. And we need to be able to provide that context. And just as an aside, one of my uh, visions for solution for many of these issues is that, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry enjoys a unique reputation or a unique position in the com so-called competitive marketplace uh, where they can essentially set a price and we've seen skyrocketing mm -hmm. costs at no, you know, no cost to the company. But I, I believe that if a proportion of the, either the profits or the amount spent on advertising would go towards unbiased comparative clinical trials um, that would dissuade companies from coming out with Me Too drugs and give doctors and patients alike a better idea of which of our alternatives might be actually better. Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be nice. I'm gonna, we're gonna skip ahead to one, to this, because this is my, I'm sorry, my, one of my favorite advertisements of all time. Has it, so I'm curious, has anybody here ever prescribed Roserum or Romeltion? Okay, I've got two takers. Okay, it's a melatonin analog, it's not used very often, but this is, I, I still think it's one of my favorite ad campaigns of all time. Not to bias you at all, okay. Hey, it's Sleeping Beauty. I didn't sleep a wink. I know, we've been waiting for you. Have the chest set already? He cheats. Hello, Honest Abe. <laughs> Whatever. We just haven't played for so long. I know, I just got all this stress at work. It's cool, it happens to a lot of people. Really? Absolutely. More than half of adults report experiencing some kind of insomnia at least a few nights a week. We just want you back. Thanks, guys. When you can't sleep, you can't dream. That's why there's Roserum, the first and only prescription sleep aid that in clinical studies shows no potential for abuse or dependence. Take it when you need it. Stop when you don't. Your doctor can explain why Roserum. I'm going to skip the, the, the side effect delineation there. I'm sorry, I just love that ad. It's, just, it's highly entertaining for me. Um, anyways, um, this last, I'm going to just take a, a, another couple minutes here if that's okay. This, this last is, one is very, I think, very interesting for me. It kind of marks the new, some of the new age or new frontier in advertising that we're seeing contemporarily. Binge eating disorder, or BED, isn't just overeating. It's a real medical condition. And while the exact cause is unknown, certain chemicals in the brain may play a role. BED is also the most common eating disorder in U.S. adults. Hi, I'm Monica Sellis. My binge eating episodes would usually happen in the evenings when I would be back uh, by myself after a long day at the tennis courts and would just eat large quantities of food. My eating was just uncontrollable. Once the binge was over, I felt so upset with myself. For me, it took a long time to seek professional help because there's a stigma around it. And I think being an athlete, being in the public eye also didn't help. So when I did feel comfortable enough to reach out to a doctor and talk about my condition, it was really like a huge relief. To learn more about BD, go to bingeeatingdisorder.com and talk with your doctor. Okay, so this did not mention a single pharmaceutical, right? So this ad came out uh, after the DSM-5 was published, which codified uh, binge eating disorder. It also came out shortly after Vyvanse gained approval for pharmacological treatment of binge eating disorder. You'll notice down at the bottom here amongst the sponsors for this ad, Shire Pharmaceuticals uh, paid for a large portion of this ad. Actually, Monica Sellis went on a variety of talk show um, tour shortly around this time, and also started a very active social media campaign about educating people about binge eating disorder. Monica Sellis is, is paid by Shire, um, actually, as well. Actually, if you go to, and if you go to bingeeatingdisorder.com, which we will here, here we go. This is bingeeatingdisorder.com. Also, website also uh, uh, provided for by Shire. Um, also, this does not 
this does not include any information about pharmaceuticals related to binge eating disorder, but it has what is BED, managing BED. Uh, the, my, the most interesting part about this is the talking with your doctor section. Um, I talk about this being a sensitive topic. It's difficult to talk with your provider about. Uh, often providers don't know about this condition. Uh, and maybe you've talked to your doctor about it before and this conversation didn't go as you planned. As you scroll down, um, they have different tips as to how to talk to your doctor about this. Um, so charting your symptoms, using a BED symptom checklist. This is actually, there's an app for this too, so you can download it and rate yourself on your binge eating disorder symptoms, and you can bring this to your doctor uh, and, and demonstrate that you meet diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder. Um, uh, and they give you other tips about kind of how to start the conversation with your provider, how to kind of push forward, be courageous. Um, consider that it makes time and might take multiple visits. Uh, and if your concerns aren't addressed, you can find a different doctor if they're not gonna listen to you or find an eating disorder specialist. Now, and like, I like the doctor discussion guide. You know, this is like, this is awesome stuff. Um, now, at, simultaneously, while they were running this, you notice there's no reference to Vyvanse, there's no reference to medication options, but simultaneously, while this was going on, in a number of medication journal, uh, psychiatric journals, uh, Shire was heavily, heavily publicizing Vyvanse as being a treatment for binge eating disorder, as being the only FDA-approved treatment for binge eating disorder. And so I think this is a really interesting kind of like two-pronged approach to kind of shape the conversation of the patient-doctor encounter and to provide an easy, prescribable solution, which kind of rubs me the wrong way. I don't know. What do you guys, what do you guys think about this whole situation? The term social engineering comes to mind. I mean, I don't, I don't like being, the idea of being manipulated. I don't particularly enjoy that. Um, and it, it does seem like there are some strings being pulled by somebody. Uh, does anybody think that, uh, Dr. Olson? But we invented the diagnosis. Psychiatrists <laughs> came up with it, so. What do you do about it? You have to have a treatment. I, I don't think that, you know, by, I agree with you about this, this strategy, but it's also, you know, another one of those expanded DSM diagnoses that may or may not meet the criteria for, you know, a, a separate condition or disease entity. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't know if I would have anything wrong, if I would take a whole lot of offense at this website if it was funded entirely by a advocate, patient advocacy organization. I think the fact that the pharmaceutical industry is, is producing this website, just, it just, boy, it gets under my collar, I think. But on the first, on the uh, Monica Sellis ad, you, you notice mm -hmm. that the, along with Shire, the other sponsors were two organizations, BEDA and CDA, and those are patient mm -hmm. advocacy organizations that are also probably funded by Shire. Does anybody know? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But yes, there there is some dual funding sources going on here. A comment here. Uh, we should take pause to notice how much advertising invades our lives all over the place. You, you know, most television and all over the place is advertising, advertising. I mean, we're a consumer society, and we have to buy stuff. And we're prompted to buy the best and the most that'll give us satisfaction. So, it's not an easy it's not an easy issue here to think about, except as how kind of the place we've gotten ourselves into to make our society run. Mm -hmm. um, it's a broader broader question. You're right. It's not. It's, this is certainly not restricted to medicine um, or pharmaceuticals. And we should end on that yeah. note. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Nice job. You have been digging.